It's time to be about that life, the startup life. Here's your host, Dominic Lawson. All right, Startup Nation, I hope you're ready to receive some value today. My name is Dominic Lawson. That's G on the ones and twos, and this is the Startup Life, the show for entrepreneurs and career-minded professionals. And today, Startup Nation, it's a big one. It really is a big one. First off, it's the 150th episode of the Startup Life. I just want to say, as always, when we hit these milestones, thank you for allowing me to serve you on your entrepreneurial path, your entrepreneurial journey. And with that being said, Startup Nation, we have an amazing, an amazing guest for you today uh, on the show. He is a serial entrepreneur. He's also the co-founder and first CEO of Netflix. He's the board chair of National Outdoor Leadership School, and he's also the author of That Will Never Work, The Birth of Netflix and the Amazing Life of an Idea. Startup Nation, without further ado, Mark Randolph. How's it going, Mark? It's going pretty well, Dominic. Thanks for having me on the show. Congratulations, 150 episodes. Wow. Yeah, it, it's been a pretty, pretty amazing ride, so I appreciate those kind words. Are you ready to pour some knowledge into Startup Nation today? Absolutely. Let's, uh, let's see what we can, let's see what we can do. If I have if I have anything to share, it's all yours. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, let's do it. So first things first, Mark, because in doing my show prep, I actually saw that you have a connection to Memphis. Something about uh, somebody who used to be a big cotton magnet here. Kind of share with us that story a little bit. Yeah, Julian J. Hohenberg the third. Okay, as a matter of fact, uh, and actually, it's true. My very first job out of college was in none other than Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and it was crazy. It was, you know, you, you alluded to the fact that I, I was, I'm currently the chair of something called the National Outdoor Leadership School. Mm-hmm. But way back when, this is back in 1981, um, I was used to be an instructor for the school. We were taking people out in the mountains. And one of the people that went on a Knowles course, not mine, was Julian J. Hohenberg III. Okay. Who, was the uh, inheritor of a huge cotton company fortune. And he was so taken with his Knowles instructors that when he found out through a connection about me and that I was a Knowles instructor, he said, this guy's got to come work for me. Mm. And that found me living down <laughs> in, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, just about two months after getting out of college. Awesome. awesome. And I, I got to say, it was, a, it was an eye-opener. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. That's definitely going to play well here in this in this market, Mark. So I appreciate you sharing uh, that story. And once again, Startup Nation, the book is That Will Never Work. And it's the story about how Mark was the, the, the f- co-founder and first CEO of Netflix. And so, Mark, I want to ask you this, uh, because first of all, I actually not only did I read the book, I actually listened to the audio version uh, as well. So I heard you actually read the book for sure. So you know, I know it was like 16 years after you uh, did the, uh, you know, after you left Netflix. What made you write the book after that? Why wait so long? You know, if I had written the book right after I left, maybe it would have been more historically accurate because mm-hmm. I certainly would have remembered more details, but I would have missed the big picture. And really the reason I wrote the book was I wanted people to understand the real story behind Netflix. Gotcha. And I don't just mean who said what, when. I mean to understand what went into taking an idea and making it real. And it took me 16 years to begin to recognize what were the things that we did right? What were the things that were just luck? What were the things that we thought were important back then, but in the light of history, didn't really make that much of a difference? And the bigger reason is that since leaving Netflix, I've had a chance to work with hundreds of early stage entrepreneurs and help many, many people get their companies off the ground. And what I've really realized is just how many of those things I learned at Netflix are universal, that these are Mm. things that anybody can use to get their idea off the ground, whether it's a big idea, whether it's a for-profit idea, whether it's social entrepreneurship. There's some general truths about startups that I thought I wanted people to see how they were put into action. And, you know, going back to National Outdoor Leadership School or Knowles, uh, I wanted to ask you this because there's a part in the book where uh, I think where you uh, go on, uh, where they drop you off uh, in the middle of nowhere and you kind of have to navigate your, your yourself through the wilderness and stuff <laughs> like that. And you kind of talk about how 
you learned a very important lesson that proved vital later on in your career at Netflix and beyond uh, about <laughs> how to ask, about kind of related to pitching and stuff like that, but more so how to ask for things. Can you kind of share that story a little bit and what you learned? Yeah, sure. And, it, and I would work, I would teach Knowles courses for two months per mm-hmm. summer. But the third month, I'd work for a different school. It's called the Wilderness School. Okay. And it was one of those programs that takes. Yeah, I guess they say disadvantaged youth or sometimes adjudicated youth okay. into, the, into, into, the, into the mountains, and it puts them in difficult situations where they're telling themselves, there is no way I can rappel down that cliff. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, they do rappel down that, lift, that cliff, and you can give them this lesson about the thing they thought was impossible, in fact, was possible, and you try and translate that to their life. So to make this more meaningful to the instructors, they wanted to put us in a situation where we were uncomfortable and didn't know how, in an alien environment, the same way these kids were in the woods. Mm-hmm. And the way they chose to do that was to drive us to a city. Okay. And in my case, it was Hartford, Connecticut, and drop us off, take away our wallet and our watch and our ID and our money and say, we'll see you in three days. And then we would have to survive quote unquote, in this urban environment. And it was amazing because it was, it was really hard. Um, you know, I figured, okay, I can figure out someplace to sleep, but I'm hungry. Right. And, and at first I would do that thing where you kind of float around the outside of the food court at the mall. Right. And then you wait for someone to get up and walk away from a half eaten plate of food and not bust the plate. And then you just swoop in there and you eat those leftover French fries. Um, <laughs> But the lesson that you're alluding to is I decided that I was going to cut out the middleman. I was not going to do it that way. I'd go, I wanted to get some money and I'd buy my own food. And so I decided I was going to panhandle. And I'm going, how hard could panhandling be? And the answer is uh, really hard. Mm. I mean, it's going up to someone in the street and putting your hand out and asking for money for nothing. And it took me a couple hours to get my nerve up to ask the first person and probably another couple hours before someone finally gave me things. But by the end of the day, I learned this critical skill, which was to make an ask like that, a something for nothing ask. The most powerful weapon is purpose, Mm. is to say, I'm hungry and to show it. And so they felt it. It's true. It was a big lesson because when you're raising money for a startup or even when you're trying to convince people to come work for you or help you in some way, it's close to being the same naked ask. You're asking them to quit a great job, to come work for way less money for no benefits, or you're convincing them to put money into this venture, which has no apparent way it's going to succeed. And I had to do that for Netflix, which is go up and ask people for money. I had to ask my own mom for money. Right. But I will say that after you've panhandled on the streets in Hartford, Connecticut, that asking for $25,000 is pretty easy. And speaking about asking for money, in the book, you also talk about how things have kind of changed when it comes to funding a business and asking for funding from a VC and stuff like that. Because you talk about when you were kind of starting Netflix, you could just kind of have an idea on a napkin or just kind of have pretty much just an idea. But now, these days, you really kind of have like a proof of concept. But you also talk about how... Uh, in this day and age, it's a lot easier to like build a website faster, get like an e-commerce site up and running and stuff like that. Do you think that shift is because you are able to have a proof of concept easier or is it because of the dot-com bubble in between now and then? What do you think that is? Oh, it's absolutely because the infrastructure is so much better. Gotcha. No question about it. Okay. You know, back then we started Netflix and we had the idea back in 1997, right. you know, 23 right. years ago. And back then, if you wanted to do an e-commerce website, well, you had to build it yourself. If you wanted to connect to the inter- internet, you had to get your own servers and your own routers. And you had to wire everything together. If you wanted your own security, you built it yourself. If you wanted to accept payments, you had to write your own portals to the bank payment processing systems. So even doing something simple like renting DVDs by mail took us six months just to put the website together. It took us a million dollars. But of course, now, you know, everyone listening knows that, hey, you want to do a website? Great. You go to Squarespace, pull it down, you're up and running for 
in five minutes for you know nine ninety five or something. Right. And if you want payment processing, you go to PayPal. If you want security, everything is easy. But what's great about that is that back when I was there, the distance from idea to validation was months and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now the distance from idea to validation is minutes and no money at all, which means any idea you have, you can really quickly and easily try it. And I've concluded that has fundamentally changed the art of being an entrepreneur. Right. It is no longer about having a good idea. It's hugely democratizing. You don't need to have a track record. You don't need to be older. You don't need to have a certain education. You don't need money. You just need the cleverness to take your ideas and figure out how to quickly and easily and cheaply try them. Absolutely. And that has been what's created the explosion of um, entrepreneurship and the democratization of entrepreneurship. But it doesn't just happen in Silicon Valley. It happens all over the world now. Absolutely. It's a great, great time to have ideas. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. One of the uh, stories I did love in the story, was, you know, in the book was about launch day because you talked about, you know, leading up to the launch and you talk about after lunch at nine o'clock that day, everything was great for 15 minutes. Mark, what happened after that 15 minute mark? Well, that's a great follow up to the previous comments about how hard it was back in 1997 to build a website. Right. And on that moment at nine o'clock in the morning, I wasn't worried about, well, what's Blockbuster going to do? Or mm -hmm. how are we going to transition into streaming in 10 years? Or what? how are we going to get a contract for Orange is the New Black or whatever? I was worried, will this stupid little website we threw together work? And at 9 a.m., we threw the switch and we all stood around kind of waiting. And we had rigged it up so that whenever an order came in, if an order came in, a bell would ring. Right. Um, and we all were there. We had in one corner of the room the champagne to toast our first order. And it didn't take long. It took about a minute. And then, ding, that first order. And we cheered. And we began opening up the champagne. Um, and then a few minutes later, ding, 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 like three more orders. And we're all cheering and we're laughing. Um, and a few more minutes go by and it's kind of quiet. And we're, more minutes go by and it's still quiet. And we go, is this, you know, what's going on? Is this plugged in? And it turns out that in the first 15 minutes, we had crashed our server. Wow. Yeah. And so <laughs> rather than me spending that first day toasting my success as a new, uh, a, a new entrepreneur, newly minted entrepreneur here, right. I spent that whole day driving back and forth to the big electronics store buying all the components to not only limp along our one server, but to try and put in place three or four more to try and make it through this first day. And, you know, we, we did, we had our first day ended with something like 113, 109 orders, which blew my mind because I never expected that many people would come to this site, especially in the first day. That was the whole first month forecast. Right. Right. But, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no. I say now it's like a, 109 ah, we there's 160 million subscribers <laughs> exactly who could exactly. have ever i could never have imagined that happening for sure for sure thank you for sharing that for sure so in, in that same vein mark i, I want to ask you this because you talked about it up and down the book many entrepreneurs and small business owners go through it almost every day and is managing crisis in that moment kind of talk about your philosophy in managing crisis, not only from an internal standpoint with your team, but also from an external standpoint with the ultimate stakeholder, which is the customer. Yeah, um, I think, you know, you, we started off by talking about why it took time to write this book. And a lot of it was me thinking about what is it that really are the important factors that go into being successful as an entrepreneur. And I've kind of concluded that one of the most important ones is, I call it, it triage. And, you know, in triage, you're probably familiar with that, is that, that it's basically splitting, um, in, the, in the original case, injured people in war into three groups. The ones who, there's some group who are going to die no matter what you do, and some are going to survive no matter what you do. In the middle group, they'll die if you ignore it, and they'll live if you take care of it. And that's the one you want to focus on. Right. And I think that triage applies absolutely to a startup. Because in that case, you have a hundred things that are broken. 
hundreds of things that are on fire, that are screaming for attention, but you only have the capacity to, do, to deal with a handful of them. And too many entrepreneurs feel they have to get everything right. Mm. But what I think I've realized is the really successful ones deal with that chaos by having, one, this intuitive sense of which of these hundreds of things that are broken, if they just focus on these two or these three, then everything else won't matter. And they may not even be the things that are the screaming the loudest or apparently the most important. But then they have to have this corresponding second skill which is the ability to focus on those and relentlessly go, I'm going to get these things right. And the more chaos, the more you have to have triage, the more you have to focus on the handful of things that if you get them right, you'll make it. Like at the beginning, there was a million things. To, you know, how do we get every single DVD? How do we get our shipments right? How do we make sure our website works? Right. But fundamentally, if you don't have customers, nothing happens. And so at the beginning, I decided number one was I had to get customer flow, even if the website wasn't ready for it. And this was not trivial because originally we were a DVD by mail business and there were hardly any DVD player owners. Right. And everything I did was focused on that one thing. How do you find these needles in a haystack? For sure. For sure. Thank you for sharing that. And so, Mark, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is kind of a you know, one that I, I'm always talking to my audience about because I always talk about how, you know, a great CEO is one that's always willing to do whatever is best for the company as a whole, because the company is what ultimately matters, even if that means sacrificing yourself. And you talk about in your book where there's a very interesting conversation between you and Reed uh, about, you know, the next phase of Netflix can you kind of share with us that story and why was it for you to like you to ultimately decide, you know what, this is what's best for Netflix? Yeah, that, this was when we started the company. Um, Reed Hastings was my angel investor, but he wasn't working at the company. Right. Um, you know, he was chairman of my board. But, I, you know, I was got the bill, got the bill, read the space, hired the people, the whole thing. Right. But not long in. um Reed was come popping in every now and then, checking in on things. We'd talk all the time. And one evening, one early, late afternoon, early evening, I was at my desk, and all of a sudden, Reed pops his head in, and he goes, you know, Mark, we need to talk. And as anyone who's ever heard someone deliver that line, uh, they know <laughs> that's not going to be a necessarily good news. Right. And Reed came in, and, you know, he had his, his notebook computer with him, and he kind of sat me down and kind of began walking me through this uh, PowerPoint slideshow and started out well enough about all the positive things he saw with the company. But then it quickly segued into areas where he was concerned, mm. concerned about my judgment, concerned about my hiring, concerned about some strategic choices I was making. And at first I was starting to freak out. Because, you know, uh, what was going to happen here, I thought maybe I was getting, he was going to fire me because he had m more stock than I did. But what I realized was that what Reed was really saying was that he was concerned about where we were going. And he wasn't saying that I was the wrong person. He was saying that this company is going to be stronger if there's two of us doing it. Gotcha. And he was proposing he come in full time with me uh, to run the company that he would come in as a CEO, that I would slide over um, and be president, but um, he'd be in charge, uh, and we'd run it as a, a couple. Gotcha. And that was really, really tough, because I had had this dream of starting and running this successful company. And I realized that now that we were going, now that we'd raised money, we had customers that it wasn't just my dream anymore, that it, this dream of a successful company belonged to the employees and to the investors and to the customers. And I kind of realized also that it was kind of two dreams and they were separate ones. One was the, the dream of me running the show. Right. And the other dream was being successful. And I ultimately decided that it was more important in this case 
to do everything I could to make sure the customer was success, the company was successful. Right. And it was hard to argue with the fact that having Reed and me together was not going to make that the case. And it's not like I came to fully comfort with this in five minutes. Right. I mean, it took, a, you know, it took a, a long night of, t- t- of tossing and turning and an evening of sitting out in the porch with my wife, having a, a bottle of wine. And, but ultimately I decided that this was the best thing. And, you know, if I have to look back on all the decisions I made as um, CEO of Netflix, in many ways, that probably was the best decision I ever made, which was to bring Reed in. Not only because when he joined, those next few years were in many ways the renaissance at Netflix. Absolutely. But then certainly look at what he's accomplished, you know, since then. For sure. For sure. A quick follow up, Mark, if I could, because you you also talk about how this happens in startups all the time where the, the people who start out with the company are not necessarily the ones who move forward, uh, you know, stay with the company moving forward. It's kind of, you almost kind of talk about the people in that next iteration of employees are kind of like super specialists. Kind of talk about that, that transition from the people who start out and then match, you know, as it, the, the company uh, matures, moving to people who are like kind of those super specialists to kind of grow the company even further. Yeah, it's a very hard thing as a founder of a company to watch that happen. Right. Because you're right. At the beginning, when you have that thing I described a few moments ago with 100 things on fire, <laughs> you have these people who are generalists. Right. You can rush one fire to the other. And they have the skills, the basic skills to do almost anything and do it in a very self-directed way. But if you're lucky and your company begins to scale and you begin to have some financial resources, you find yourself in this position where you can afford and have the reputation to bring in some really superstars who know way more than you do in, let's say, marketing. And another person knows way more than you do in sales. Another person way more than you do in operations. But as you bring them in, the people who sacrificed for you, who worked like crazy, who gave everything to the company, are no longer the right people. And it requires this very painful but very honest conversation with them about it's time for us to bring in someone for the next stage and it's not you. For sure. And in in my cases, I had to deliver that message a lot. And in my case, you know, I recognize that it applied to me too, that I wasn't the right person to run this company long term, that the skills that I had were great for an early stage company, but we're really mediocre or poor as a company got bigger and more complicated. Got you. Got you. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm so glad you pointed that out, Mark, because we live uh, in this day and age, you know, in entrepreneurship where a, a lot of it is more about vanity than the company itself. And so I'm, I'm really glad that you, you kind of highlight uh, and pointed that out. So I appreciate your value that you added there for sure. Well, I'm actually going to kick it over to uh, a good friend of mine, uh, I actually mentor in a group here in Memphis called Light Memphis. Let's educate through edu- let's innovate through education, uh, and it's equipping African American Latinx students with 21st century skills to create wealth through entrepreneurship programming. And so we have uh, where we have uh, students come in 16 week program and they go through an entrepreneurship course and then it culminates in a pitch night. And I actually have a pitch night winner with me, Asia Jackson, who's going to ask you the next question. Go ahead, Asia. Hello, I'm Asia Jackson, and I just have one question for you. What do you consider the first step in forming a company in general? Because many people get discouraged and when they want to actually start a company, but they don't generally know the first steps or the first step in that matter. So the question is, what, what, what's the first step to take in starting a company? Did I hear you right? Yes, sir. Well, that's an easy one. The sim- <laughs> the easy one to say, hard one to do. <laughs> and the biggest mistake I see new entrepreneurs do is they don't start. Mm. They have this idea and they love their idea. And their idea is at this point only in their head. And inside their head, it's nice and safe and warm. And so it's really easy to see how all the things you do in your head are successful. And in your head, the idea is getting bigger and bigger and you're adding on customers and then you do this, but it's all illusory. Mm -hmm. And the trick is, As soon as you have an idea, you've got to get it out of your head. And that's hard because the real world's a harsh place for ideas. Most ideas are bad ones. And let me give you a specific example. 
So way back in 1997, Reed Hastings and I were both going to be out of a job, and we were brainstorming ideas for this new company. And we had hundreds of ideas. And then one of the ones that popped into our head was maybe we can do DVD rental by mail. Now, good idea? Maybe. Bad idea? Maybe. Who knows? And so what we didn't do is then say, okay, let's go to the office and I'll begin working on a business plan, which would be having it in my head. We didn't say, let's go work on a pitch deck and begin raising money. We didn't go trying to book ourselves on a shark tank or something. We said, let's quickly collide this idea with reality. And so we just turned the car around mid-commute and drove back down to the town we lived in and looked for a DVD that we could mail to ourselves. And of course, there were no DVDs back then because it was in test market. So we went and bought a music CD and bought a little gift envelope. And we mailed the DVD, the CD to ourselves and demonstrated in less than 24 hours that this crazy idea, well, at least the first stage of it may not be so crazy anymore. So if you have an idea, the first thing to do, figure out a quick, cheap, and easy way to collide your idea with reality. Don't build a minimal viable product. Don't try and raise money. Just figure out how to quickly get some data about whether your idea is real or not. I hear that. Thank you for sharing all of that, Mark, for sure. Once again, we're talking to Mark Randolph, the author of What That Will Never Work. So, Mark, one of the famous stories that's, that people often talk about is the one with Blockbuster, where you or uh, you and Reed were called in to go kind of pitch to Blockbuster, and everything seems to be going well, and then they essentially kind of laugh at you guys when you ask for $50 million, right? So, uh, But I want to ask you this, because, you know, as we know, Blockbuster is not really here anymore. But, but what I want to ask you is this. If you and Ree were on the opposite end and you were on Blockbuster's side, what is it that would have seen to say, you know what, we need to move forward? I guess basically what I'm asking is, what did Blockbuster miss about Netflix at that time? Because clearly it worked, right? But what were they missing? Well, the first thing, the clearly it worked part. <laughs> right. Now. <laughs> right, for sure, for sure. Clearly it worked. <laughs> but looking at that point wasn't clear. But the thing that they missed is probably the same thing that most, most big companies missed. And the, what they missed is not, they knew, or they were pretty confident that eventually movies were going to be distributed in a way other than over a counter at a blockbuster store. Mm -hmm. But they got caught up in the same thing that every successful company gets caught up in, which is um, we're not, we don't need to deal with that now. In fact, we don't want to distract ourselves by getting caught up in that now. Gotcha. Why do we want to take our best people and put them onto a business which at the best would maybe create 1% of our revenues? We should have our best people on the core business. But in fact, the core business is what's slowly but surely going downhill. Right. And what they missed is that this was the future, and they should have bet everything on it, even at the expense of somehow making their current business a little bit less powerful. And that's a really hard thing to do. But listen, that's, that's great news for all the entrepreneurs in your audience, that all these big established companies are very vulnerable because you're going to come after them doing something that they can't do or something they won't do, or something that they're scared to do. And that's what makes it so exciting these days to be an entrepreneur. I hear that. I hear that. Thank you for sharing all that for sure. Mark, one of the last things that you were working on before you left Netflix was this idea of Netflix Express, kind of like this movies in a kiosk type thing, right? And then it ultimately Reed said, you know what, we're not going to move forward with that. But your good friend Mitch you know, took it and he developed a company that we may know and love. It's called Redbox. So I want to ask you this. Is Redbox the one that got away? <laughs> no, because, you know, listen, Redbox turned into a big, a big success. Absolutely. You know, for Mitch Lowe. Right. But, you know, the reason that we, that we just came back from this test of kiosk and decided not to pursue it at Netflix was that it was defocusing. Mm. So yes, it would have been an interesting business, but right. it would have brought us into having to be in the hardware business and having to have people in all these geographies to service and restock these machines. And fundamentally, we decided that the effort it would take to be in that business was way better invested 
by focusing on our core business. I hear that. And um, I don't think that was a bad decision at all. And in fact, those decisions happen all the time. And I talk about it in the book, and we call it the Canada principle. Right. Everyone says, hey, you can get 10% more uh, revenue just by expanding into Canada. It's easy. But these things that seem easy aren't easy. For sure. Different language problems, currency problems, cultural problems. And you realize that 10%, way, way better invested at your core business. For sure. For sure. Thank you for sharing that. So, Mark, I want to ask you this because, you know, I, I saw an interview that you gave uh, a few months ago where you're talking about streaming services and everybody's wondering, is there too much in the marketplace? Is there saturation in the marketplace when it comes to streaming? And you say no, that competition is good. But what I want to ask you, Mark, is this, because what I'm thinking about is the customer, because, you know, there was a point where I can just pay one price and I have all these channels. But now I feel like I'm kind of getting nickeled and dimed here. Well, ultimately, that'd be a, a problem in the marketplace. Do you uh, kind of foreshadow a little bit? So I don't think so. I mean, yes, right now, we're a few years ago, we were all paying one price. Right. I don't know about you, but my one price was like $119 a month or something right. crazy. Got you. And now I'm paying three prices. You know, I'm paying six ninety five for Netflix and four ninety five for Disney or whatever, whatever, the, whatever the numbers really are. Mm-hmm. And it allows you to pick and choose. I think ultimately, I mean, there's like 250 streaming channels right now, right? And right. it allows you to specialize. And I don't mean, but from the business side, I mean the consumer side. Like I subscribe to some crazy stuff. I subscribe to one channel which only streams Australian Rules football because I really <laughs> love watching AFL. Gotcha. And uh, that just wouldn't be happening. That's never going to be carried by Comcast. Gotcha. Um, and so it allows us. To fundamentally have choice, and I think uh, I think choice is great. And I think is everyone going to have to choose one? No. Are they going to have to have all two hundred and fifty? No, either. They'll pick three or four that suit their needs, and they'll still be paying a fraction of what they were paying before, and they'll be getting much better content. So, Mark, I, 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 you know, when we said that we were going to be talking to you uh, today, I, I kept getting this one question. I, I have to ask you. Uh, because, you know, as you know, sometimes we build companies and they kind of become part of cult, pop culture. Right. <laughs> and so you are very much aware of the, the phrase Netflix and chill. So I want to ask you this. When you first heard about that phrase and what it meant and stuff like that, what first came to mind? <laughs> well, you know, uh, when you start a company, a lot of things are out in the future. Right. Uh, you know, one is what's are you ever going to be a. I never imagined we'd be in every country in the world. I never imagined we'd have 160 million subscribers. I never imagined we'd be up for Oscars for uh, Absolutely. movies we produced. But I, I got to tell you, I never saw a Netflix <laughs> and chill coming. <laughs> <laughs> got you. Got you. Thank you for sharing that for sure. I, I want to ask you this. And once again, Startup Nation, we're wrapping up with Mark Randolph, the author of That Will Never Work. So I want to ask you this because, you know, we have many great entrepreneurial duo, duos. You have Gates and Allen, Brennan and Page, Wozniak and Jobs. Where does Ra- Randolph and Hastings rank in that regard? Oh, well, certainly you picked a whole bunch of good ones. Those, those, <laughs> those companies you named have all created huge, uh, enduring uh, companies, including, you know, I'll put Netflix in that category, and I'm Absolutely. extremely flattered to be in that category. But I think one of the things it demonstrates is that being successful, despite what culture says, is not a one-person thing. Mm. It is wrong to think that starting a company is all on you. It is very much a team effort, and not just a Wozniak and Jobs or Hastings and Randolph. But at Netflix case, there was dozens of people. Absolutely. Each contributed a little bit of themselves into this DNA that makes the company successful. And when you realize that, it's a really healthy thing. It's a team effort. You have to build a team. You've got to create a culture um, that allows many, many people to help, where everyone's ideas are accepted. That's what makes it a great and enduring company, not just one or two famous people. For sure. I'm so glad you said that. And when you talk about that, you know, Mitch Lowe comes to mind that we talked about earlier. Also, Patty McCord, who you know, who's often cited as kind of revolutionizing how we look at HR and companies and stuff like that. So I'm really glad you said that for sure. As I read the book, Mark, you know, you know, there, there's many people who come 
you know, uh, into the book, you know, often Hastings, you know, McCord, uh, Mitch and stuff like that. But there's one common denominator, and that's your wife, Lorraine. How important has she been on your path to entrepreneurship success? Well, uh, uh, critical, I right. would say. Um, and But largely not because she's in the background doing the accounting or something like that. Right. But because I recognized early on how important balance was. Uh, and not just when starting a company, in anything. I mean, I vowed really early on that I did not want to be one of those entrepreneurs who was on their sixth company, uh, but also on their sixth wife. And I said, we are going to make sure that this is a partnership that I spend time with my best friend. Um, and it's not an easy thing to start a company and maintain the relationships in your life. But if you make it the priority, you can do that sort of thing. And Lorraine was always there. I mean, she was the person I could come home to and, and, and we could sit and talk about things and give me the sense that the company's not everything. There's other aspects of our life that are important. I had to, just really quickly, I had this sure. you know, tradition where every Tuesday at five o'clock, I would leave work and leave my papers on my desk and we would have a date night. And I didn't care. If, you know, if there was a crisis, well, we're going to resolve it by five. And if you have to talk to me, well, great. We're going to talk on the way to the car. But the cool thing is that you can talk all you want about the importance of balance and family time. But if you're not demonstrating it, it's just lip service. And when people saw that I was willing to walk out at five o'clock once a week, then they began doing it. And it created this culture that it was important to have more than just your work. And I'll, I'll close by really saying, you know, I said Netflix is my was six is one of seven companies that I've had a hand in starting. Some quite successful, but when I um, ask about what I'm most proud of, it is not starting and growing Netflix. It's not Looker. It's not any of the other startups. It's that I did all those things while I was able to stay married to the same woman and to have my kids grow up knowing me and as best as I can tell, liking me, right. and had time to pursue the things that I knew made me whole as a person. That's what I'm proud of. I hear that. Thank you so much. So, Mark, really quickly, your entrepreneurial superpower and why? <laughs> Focus uh, is that I really have this ability to put the blinders on and recognize what's the key thing I have to do mm -hmm. and do nothing else but that. Um, really, really helpful, especially if you're not particularly talented in a lot of things. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. And so the last question, you know, before I ask you, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the Startup Life. We really appreciate the value and the time that you've given us. It really uh, great content uh, that we can definitely chew on and put in our entrepreneurial toolkit. And Startup Nation, I definitely advise that you put that will never work in your uh, book rotation because not only is it an amazing and full of value, but it really uh, reads like an amazing novel if you would, for sure. So, Mark, I'm actually going to turn the microphone over to you because there's an entrepreneur out there who's either stuck in their business or they're afraid to even start. Give them some words of encouragement to take us out today. So everyone who starts a business, every successful business started out just where you are now with nothing more than an idea in your head. And what separates the people who end up being successful with the business is that they start. They do something. They make something. They build something. They try something. They test something. And if you don't do that, if you don't take those steps, you'll never get there. If you wait until you know what's around the corner, well, someone's already going to beat you to it. Um, that risk-taking is fundamental. And if you're not out there doing it, you've got to ask yourself, what's holding you back? There isn't anything. For sure. For sure. And good luck. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. And that's going to wrap up our time with Mark Randolph. Thank you so much, Mark, for coming on the show. This was great, and I really appreciate you having me on. Oh, no worries. Thank you so much. And as always, Startup Nation, if you have an idea, be about that life, the startup life. <laughs>